Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for 292 Baby Educational Videos, Support for Parents and Caregivers of Infants. I would like you to know that all of the experts featured in our video series have given freely of their time and all are from the Early Childhood Community of Greater Rochester. On behalf of everyone affiliated with the 292 Baby Project, we wish you the very best of luck with your children. Welcome to 292 Baby. I'm Joseph Hill, Communications Director for the Coalition to Prevent Lead Poisoning. This show is about childhood lead poisoning. Our two guests with me are the founders of the Coalition to Prevent Lead Poisoning, Ralph Spezio, former principal of School 17 in the city. He's now currently with the University of Rochester's Department of Community and Preventive Medicine and Dr. David Broadbent a retired pediatrician. I'm going to start out, both of you gentlemen, uh, and maybe for you, Dr. Broadbent, what is childhood lead poisoning? Uh, childhood lead poisoning is a condition which is caused by lead, and it's, ca it's uh, the result of the poisoning that comes about is loss of IQ, behavior problems, and learning problems. What happens in the brain is that the lead molecules compete with the calcium molecules in the brain and pretty soon the brain doesn't work the way it's supposed to because calcium has been replaced by lead. Okay. Permanent damage. But now for those moms out there, how can a child get lead poisoning? What's that whole process like? One of the easiest uh, things for a child to do at age uh, 9 months, 12 months, 15 months and 2 is to a hand or a finger in the child's mouth. And so as the child wanders from place to place on the floor or tries to walk and falls, is to put a hand in the mouth. And there goes the dust that the child has touched on the floor or on the shelf or on the windowsill. That's how easy it is to get lead into a child's mouth. And the amount that knee is needed to poison a child it's so small you can hardly see it. Okay. Now, Ralph, explain this to me. Dr. Broadbent's told us how a child is, is lead poisoned, but, you know, all homes don't have lead, especially modern homes. So what does it take, first of all, for lead to be in a house for a child to even be exposed to it? <clears throat> well, if, if, a ch if even if a house is really well maintained and um, if it's an older house, and if it's when you say older, what what year was lead taken out of paint in the United we, States? We generally talk about 1978. Uh, lead was taken out of gasoline and paint, but um, it was really taken out of paint in 1978. So now we have latex paint covering the lead paint, um, and that's significant because if uh, you're going to do a uh, remodeling job in a house, um, you really have to bear that in mind and use lead safe work practices. Um, that's really important to know about that. But even before we go to lead safe work practices, houses built before 1978 has lead in it. 
but how does the lead, what form is it in when it becomes uh, available, if you will, for small children? What happens to that paint in that older house that the child gets exposed to lead paint in the first place? Well, there's a few things that can happen. Originally, for the paint, it was designed to be chalky. Sometimes you have passed your hand along a wall, an older, an older building, and seen that chalkiness. Uh, those are, it uh, could be, uh, microparticles of lead it's designed to, to flake or chalk. But even a window opening and closing, wood surfaces uh, rubbing against each other, or doors that are rubbing wood on wood, uh, usually window sills and windows uh, create those microparticles of lead dust. Um, that's, that can be devastating, especially to a child, as Dr. Broadbent said, uh, in those really vulnerable periods. I, I know 292 Baby uh, does a wonderful job in describing what is called periods of brain opportunity. And that's what parents and doctors and uh, we just rally around the child for stimulating that child um, in their development. Uh, when we talk about environmental toxins like lead poisoning, we can also call those periods periods of brain vulnerability because when the baby, is, you know, especially around two years old, uh, those are toddlers. And when they're crawling and teething and they have natural hand-to-mouth behaviors, as Dr. Broadbent said, um, it doesn't take much. That's also the time. Uh, if they have hand-to-mouth behaviors, uh, what we don't see is a huge explosion of uh, normal brain development during that developmental period. So when you put the two together, ingestion of the environmental toxin, lead poisoning, and the child's natural brain development at uh, around two years old, um, that's a formula for disaster. Um, you know, that really is a monster. We've called it the invisible monster that devours our children right before our very eyes. Okay. Here's one I want to ask, uh, Dr. Broadbent. Uh, we talked about homes being uh, older than 1978, having lead paint. What, do, what does a, a home that's dangerous, if you will, for children as far as exposure to lead paint, what would that typically look like? How would the paint look? Over a 30 to 40 year period, it would be normal for there to be wear and tear in the house. The woodwork, the walls, if they were painted with lead, would gradually chip. The paint would peel, and that paint that's uh, chipping and peeling, when it's ground up by the normal wear and tear in a house, becomes part of the dust of the house. So. The mother who's worried about lead, and I would hope all of our mothers would be worried about lead at age one and two, need to be alert for the chipping and the peeling paint and the chipping and the peeling walls and the places where plaster is falling apart and perhaps the places where water damage has uh, occurred in the ceilings. All of that sets the stage for the lead to be turned into dust which then becomes available for the child. Now, you talked about hand-to-mouth uh, action is the main way that children become lead poisoned. Right. Can they become lead poisoned by simply breathing, ingesting, if you will, the particles uh, created by deteriorated lead paint? Well, sad to say, but uh, if the uh, condition of the home and the housekeeping practices of the parents just aren't what they need to be, that dust in the home can be airborne. And sure, people can breathe air with the dust in it into their lungs and they can be poisoned that way. Unfortunately, that happens in industrial settings. So if a father or a mother works in a setting where lead is vaporized and is in the air, then that can be a problem for the adult. So while we're on the subject, Let's say an adult is in the painting business, construction business, a dad, and he's got the, uh, the, you know, the, the overhauls on and he comes in. I've actually run into instances where the husband slash father is resistant to change clothes. 
uh, to keep those clothes maybe in the truck, change clothes at work, uh, if an opportunity to take a shower, even a shower. How conscious should people who work in those industries be if they have small children and they come home? Because it's natural for the child to come run to daddy and for the dad to pick the child up and hug the child. Right. How careful should they be? If I were the father, I would make sure that I cleaned myself up before I left to go home. I wouldn't want to take the lead into my home. Even if I lived in a new house, if I bring lead into my house, I pose a hazard for my child. One more thing. There's another way that children are lead poison, uh, especially in the city of Rochester, especially in the, in the core inner city, um, and that's lead in the soil. Can you tell me briefly, both of you, about lead in the soil, how it gets there, and the fact that children can be exposed that way? I, I you know, it, with any of this, uh, ignorance is not bl bliss. We really have to be informed uh, so that we can protect our children. Uh, for example, uh, what I've always advised and follow is uh, outside shoes and inside shoes. We all know children, with, with sneakers especially, go outside and the dirt gets into the tread of the sneaker, it dries, and then goes into the house. Well, it creates more work uh, for the, uh, uh, the housekeeping. But more than that, uh, there is lead in the soil. Uh, don't forget now that we've had uh, lead and gasoline, especially around driveways and, uh, and that type of thing, when the lead went through the gasoline onto the driveway into the soil. So it does uh, get onto shoes and c can come in the house. So you have to be vigilant with that. I think the other thing, too, is that with the vigilance of the housekeeping, whether it's lead safe work practices for remodeling, but just regular housekeeping. Uh, vacuuming, um, it's a really good idea to have a, a vacuum cleaner with a HEPA filter uh, the, the, or, or to really be very careful when you are vacuuming and at least get uh, good advice with that. And of course, you can go to our website for that. Okay. Dr. Broadbent, uh, from what I understand, another way that the soil can become saturated, if you will, with lead is the exterior of a house where the lead paint is deteriorating. We have an awful lot of rain in this area. We have snow and the runoff. Is that true? That's true. And uh, turns out that porches and the drip line around the houses are wonderful places to get lead. So what should a homeowner do? Ideally, would put grass and shrubs around the house to keep the dirt in place and ideally would make sure that the porch surfaces are well maintained. Okay. A couple more questions. How can parents, especially for you, Dr. Broadbent, but Ralph, please chime in, how can parents keep their children safe from lead poison? Well, good housekeeping is one way. Another is good hand washing of both the parents, the child, and other children in the house. And uh, Ralph's comment about uh, having indoor things indoors and outdoor things outdoors is a good way of thinking about it. But house, good housekeeping practice is very good, keeping in mind that the hazardous places are any place where there's chipping or peeling paint. That's going to be uh, at uh, window wells and window uh, w windows, and it's going to be where doors open and close. And if I were a parent, I'd say, I want to make sure I maintain the surfaces in my house very well, as well as do good housekeeping. Okay. You know, the, the, I haven't met a parent yet that didn't want the best for their child. And we all know as adults, there are dangers that we can see, and there are dangers that we can't see. This is a danger, lead poisoning, that we want every single parent wants to avoid for their child. I can tell you as an elementary school principal, I can also tell you as a teacher that what lead does to children in the classroom is devastating. It, it makes it so children have a hard time focusing. They have their, it makes them impulsive. They're, they're, they do actions before they think about it. It also has a, a difficulty with children sometimes in processing and reading 
So in other words, there's hearing processing delays, or there can be a, a whole host of problems with memory. Uh, the list goes on and on, and that's just what it does to the brain. Uh, it can create stomach aches, uh, pressure on organ systems, um, even hypertension. I mean, this is really an insidious monster. There is no place for lead in a child's body or anyone's body, and it's a serious issue that we really have to uh, pay close attention to. Dr. Robin, can you tell me about, uh, and thank you very much, I'm glad you added the educational uh, part of this in the loss of IQ, the loss of this, as many as seven IQ points, which is vital for children. Dr. Broadbent, uh, I understand there's a state law that requires uh, doctors, pediatricians, to, to test children for lead. Can you tell me about that? Uh, the law says test children at age one and age two. The good news is that it's a reminder to physicians to do that. The bad news is that some physicians just have not taken it as seriously as we'd like them to. We want them to take it seriously whether they practice in rural upstate New York or suburban upstate New York or urban upstate New York. Some pediatricians are reluctant to test. It hurts. Child has to go to the laboratory. Lots of reasons, lots of excuses that parents can use to not test. But we would hope that through programs like 292 Baby, we can get the message across that even if the doctor is a little bit or a lot reluctant to test, the mother or the father or the grandmother or the grandfather says to the doctor, please test my child around age one and please test my child around age two. Some parents and some doctors get a test result that is reassuring at age one and they forget about it. Well, guess what? Age two is really the time when we need to worry more than age one. So it's nice that people worry at age one, even more nice when they worry about the well-being of their children at age two. Why should they be concerned about age two, Ralph? Well, I mean, I, from the latest brain research, uh, and we're finding out a lot. I mean, the researchers are doing a lot of work uh, in finding that there is explosive brain development right around that age. So age one is very important. Age two is just as important, if not even more so. Um, and the whole idea of, t of testing, even before the testing, is primary prevention. So all the things that we've been talking about, um, the whole idea is to keep the lead out of children. We don't want to test children and find that there's a problem because that's permanent damage. The whole idea is to keep children safe from this invisible monster um, and we then protect their potential. Mm -hmm. Children need to have all the IQ and all the potential that they've been born with uh, for a happy and successful and productive life. Right. And one more thing about age too, and I don't mean to belabor it, but at age one, the child is very close to his or her mom. They're not that mobile at age one. And at age two, uh, jokingly say they're practically driving. But at age two, two-year-olds are all over all the place, over place, and their environment gets wider, and they can get into more things, and they can actually be more exposed to lead. They're taller, and they're right at that height where they can play in the windowsill, that sort of thing. Before we end the segment, gentlemen, uh, is there anything briefly that either, either one of you want to add uh, that uh, moms and dads can learn something about childhood lead poisoning? Real quickly. Yeah. Uh, thanks to programs like 292 Baby, we have a chance to get the message out to parents to worry about this. The parent who finds chipping and peeling paint has an opportunity to do a big service for the child by doing something about that. And we would hope that parents who live in apartments, as well as parents who live in their own homes, who have chipping and peeling paint, would have, it, have their homes checked to make sure that there isn't a hazard. And if there is a hazard, to take responsibility to make sure that something is done to protect their children by having that peeling and chipping paint taken care of. Ralph, briefly? Yeah. I would just say that um, 
parents should not feel that they're alone with this or that they don't have resources. Uh, Rochester, Monroe County, uh, 292 Baby, uh, the Coalition to Prevent Lead Poisoning, and so many others are there to give advice, guidance, and help. So reach out. Uh, you're not alone. Uh, you can get the help that you need and the advice. Uh, this is all about children and putting children first. Okay. This is the end of segment one about childhood lead poisoning. Uh, we'll be back with the next segment. We'll look at a rural mom who had a close brush with childhood lead poisoning. Well, when my daughter went to her radi ra uh, a regular pediatrician appointment back when she was eight months old, uh, her pediatrician happened to live in this house, so she knew it was at risk for lead levels. So she had her tested early, and uh, her levels were high. And well, I found a lot of very high numbers. Matter of fact, the highest number that I've ever gotten off of a, a component uh, was in this home here was a 55.9 which meant that there was an awful lot of lead and basically lead-based paint back in in that era was sold on how much lead was in the paint the higher the contents of lead the more and the unfortunate thing is with lead-based paint the older it is and um, it starts to become flaking and airborne it becomes a powder and um, a lot of children that I've seen, a lot of them, they don't have pica. Pica is where the child literally eats the paint right off the component. And uh, the majority of lead poisoning is airborne lead poisoning. From the years of being on there and breaking down, becoming a powder, that becomes airborne. And the children either play on the floor, they get it on their hands, and they put their hands in their mouth or they put the toys in their mouth and, and they become lead poison. It's that, that simple, you know. The highest we you know, I, I wouldn't even eat preservatives when I was pregnant in order to make sure that my daughter was healthy. And to know that I was walking around in my house with lead dust poisoning my eight-month-old baby, possibly have a neurological damage the rest of her life, I was just aghast. And that mom you just heard from, Julie Simmons, is with us in the studio. Also with us is Jamie Barkley. She's with the Rochester Re Real Estate Investment Club. But before we talk to you, Jamie, we want to pick up your story, Julie. What happened? Now, you talked about your eight-month-old had a high blood lead level number. What was the number in... Uh, Fiona, she was eight months old, and when I received a report from the public health nurse, she said that Fiona's lead levels were three times the normal amount, which was 31.3. And when I heard this on the answer machine, I thought for sure they had the wrong person. And I was willing to go over the message again to call them to let them know they had the wrong person. And then I thought we had this lead test done in the morning. And then clips of all the work that we were doing on our house came to mind, and I was just sunk. I knew excuse me, I'm sorry, that my daughter was lead poisoned and it was because we were walking around in our 6,000 square foot home full of lead paint. Tell us about that home. I mean, you have a beautiful home outside of Canandaigua, large, but it's quite old. So tell us about the home and, and how Fiona was exposed to lead. Well, she was exposed to lead because I was simply walking around on our carpets. I did not see any paint chipping. It was an impeccable condition, even considering the age that it was um, built in 19, or 1838. So when I was walking around with my infant, I was pick, stirring up dust, which she was ingesting. So every time she touched the cat, every time she touched a toy or her books, she was ingesting the dust. And it's something that you don't read in your pediatric books. It's something I've not been exposed to in my pediatrician's visits. So I, I guess I never saw the dust, and so I didn't think she was ingesting it. So what happened next? How did you get help? 
Well, the public health nurse called to let us know that a public sanitarian would be coming to our house to investigate and that we are now considered a public health case, that we would not be able to do anything in our house until Fiona was off the public health list. So uh, George Lake, the public sanitarian, came. He did testing for two days. Over 250, I believe, uh, samples were taken in our house. We had the highest lead content in the state of New York in one area of the house. So uh, with help of him and with all the educational support I received from the public health agency, I read everything and did anything I could to get this under control. Now, what were some of the things that they told you to do as far as, as trying to help uh, Fiona uh, become healthy? Well, the first thing was to do is clean, clean, clean. I immediately bought a HEPA vacuum cleaner. I started using the two bucket wash, rinsing down any surface that she could possibly go. Although she wasn't walking at the time, I was walking in a similar path to the kitchen and dining room. So those areas were kept clean all the time, every day of the week. Um, I was like bought wipies, like there's no tomorrow, to continually wipe her hands even though she didn't touch anything knowing that the dust is still on her body and on her clothes. Um, I also gave her a very good iron-rich and calcium diet. I was nursing at the time and I also had a good diet to make sure that her health and that's like the most easiest way for her to get rid of the lead in her bloodstream. Um, when we visited anyone, she was not allowed to go anywhere near antiques or anywhere you know, near the shabby, chic antiques that we're in, but were full of lead paint. Um, anytime someone lit a candle that had um, glitter in it, that was also has lead paint in it. So we were just you know, kept track of everything we did. She could not play outside within 15 yards of her home because we not only had lead paint inside, but we have uh, several barns that have lead paint dripping off them, as well as a turn of the century fence. And we were on a major road that had cars traveling on it. So we had to you know, protect all surfaces inside and out um, so she wouldn't receive any more dust. Now, let's fast forward. First of all, what did you do physically uh, to your house? What have you done to remove the paint or to make your home lead safe? And, and tell us, first of all, Fiona was eight months at the time. How old is she now? She's nine. She's nine, and you have another daughter. Correct? I have another daughter, Inez, who is seven, and they are both fine. They're both healthy. They're both doing extremely well in school, and we are not concerned about any neurological long-term damage because we do feel that because we're on top of everything, cleaning with a good diet and painting, painting, painting. And I swear to you, I was nursing 12 hours a day, but then once she went to bed, I was painting all hours of the evening. So to keep that painting up, and every time there's a chip, you just go through and paint over that little chip. And it's easy to do, it's easy to control, and if I can do it in a 6,000 square foot home, inside and out, anyone can do it. Okay. Is that the advice you would give to especially young moms as far as keeping their children lead safe? Oh, absolutely. There's so much that we don't have control over, you know, the tantrums and the fussing and this and that, but we do have control over the children's diet and over their services and who they visit and what toys they put in their mouth and whether or not you choose to do construction on your home or whether you're living in an apartment that is rented, keep those services clean. It's all you can do and it's the best thing you could possibly do for your child. You also talked about washing Fiona's hands, and I imagine as she got older, even her toys. Let's talk about that a little bit, please. We continue to wash their hands all the time. I still have a box of wipies, even though I have a seven and nine year old on my radiator to this day, in case they touch something, because I still have surfaces that have not been taken care of yet. And I won't touch them until they are age 12, which we were told that's a safe level to remove them from the house. So. What we do now is we just continue to clean and continue to have the good hand washing all the time, you know, whenever they're touching something too much. If they have been exposed outside and they're playing, they come inside and they wash up. It's just something they're used to. And at one point I thought I was going to give them a compulsive disorder by keeping their hands clean, but it's, it's not true. <laughs> they're, they're fine. So, How long did it take 
before uh, Fiona's blood lead levels started coming down and you were told by your pediatrician that she was all right? It took two years. It took two years. Um, and we were at, she was at such a high level that if her number uh, did not go down one-tenth of a point in her second lead reading that we were going to be forced to move from our house and she was going to have chelation done. So it was so important to us to uh, not be financially strapped by having to rent an apartment to make sure we continue to clean and paint and good diet and hand washing. How did you get help? Who gave you the information um, to, to help you folks uh, make this amazing recovery? Our public health uh, nurse, she just gave us whenever we needed. Whenever I needed to call her, I could call her. George Like, the public sanitarian investigator who came out to our home, he would call me, he would, I could email him at any time. I was given information any time I asked for it. And I read it, and I've distributed it, and I've, you know, give it to anyone that needs it. So our public health agencies were phenomenal in this. Thank you, Julia Simmons, and also thank you to your husband, Johnny Burkhardt, who we saw in that opening um, segment. One other thing before we switch, I want to, you mentioned George Like. Um, I can't say enough good things about George Like, a diligent public servant. Uh, he was an investigator mm -hmm. for the New York State Health Department, covered five counties. George actually came in for the interview that we did, um, very, very ill. And uh, since then, George has passed away from lung cancer. So we really uh, want to say thank you to George, George's family and just remember that uh, George made a great con contribution, not only to uh, you and your family, but to many other families by consenting to uh, be interviewed for, for this program and for other things we're going to do. We are so grateful for him. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Now we're going to switch just a little bit and we're going to talk to Jamie Barkley. Uh, Jamie Barkley is with the uh, Rochester Real Estate Investment Club. Tell me first of all about the Rochester Real Estate Investment Club briefly. What do you folks do? What's the goal? The goal of our, of our club is to have an opportunity for local investors, regional and out-of-town investors to be able to come together and have an opportunity to network with each other and learn about different programs that can help them invest wiser and um, more conscientiously in our community. Okay. The reason that, uh, that you're here is because you've invited both myself a couple of times to speak to some of uh, uh, your many uh, club members. Um, and also uh, Steve Turner with ABC, who does the uh, Action for Better Communities Lead, Source, Lead Resources Center. You've had us both speak uh, to your group. Why have us come and talk to people who own property to make money? Why do that? Well, the reason why I felt like it was so important is I, this is a new position for me with the um, Real Estate Investors Club and I am a local school psychologist and I have seen firsthand the effects of lead poisoning on my students and I felt like this was a great opportunity for me to actually make a difference be able to connect the resources in our community with the people who, who need them our local housing stock primarily is the renting stock is owned by investors and what better place than the Rochester Real Estate Investors Club to bring those resources directly to the people who are providing housing. So having you join us and Steve join us is an opportunity for me to be able to offer a service to my investors and also be able to provide safe quality housing for the students that I serve. Okay. You talked, uh, when, when I talked to the Real Estate Investors Club, you actually uh, said something to, uh, to the folks gathered that, uh, that actually made me want to invite you here. You talked about, I'm going to let you say it, um, their responsibility. I feel like it's it's their responsibility. They're there to um, make some income from. These are income producing properties, but they're also members of our community and providing housing to our community. It's their responsibility to not only meet the bare minimum of the laws, our lead laws that we have in the city, but provide healthy um, happy homes for these families that, that they have in their in their apartments. And it's just good business sense. You provide a healthy, happy home for um, a good quality family and they're going to stay there. And um, the longer they're there in one home and the healthier that they are, the better it is for our whole community. Also helps them maybe help protect them as far as lawsuits. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And again, like I said, it's the bare minimum of meeting the laws. But um, but there's so many programs out there right now to be able to provide opportunities for um, property owners to improve their their units by um, giving them maybe replacement windows or siding. There's a lot of grant programs out there, and it's it's really it's a no-brainer. It, it's just there's people like yourself and Steve Turner who are willing to walk them through the process step by step and I just really wanted to be able to connect people with those services. Speaking of services and programs, I understand uh, I'm going to let you talk about this briefly that uh, there is some more money coming into the Rochester area uh, for people who own properties. Very excited about that. A number of our um, owners have taken part in that and been benefit from the $5,000 grant, the HUD grant, um, that's been going on for some time. But we have a new grant that we just, um, Mayor Duffy just announced, was it about two weeks ago, and to be able to provide, um, I think it's is it $4 million to um, wow. property owners and homeowners within the city limits for improvements to their properties for lead safety, which is really, really exciting for all of us, and I know the city in, in general. Now, most of your clients you talk to own property in the in, within the city of Rochester. Correct. Correct. That's you know a high uh, lead area. Many parts of the city are high lead area. What do you tell them to look out for? One of the things I walk around and say, um, and I, I, I find myself saying this to my own tenants um, that I that I go into their homes and I say, "How do you clean?" It's really really silly that um, I think of cleaning wet. When you clean, clean wet. That's something that really stuck with me. Little things that everyone gets those pamphlets when you move into an apartment of, of you know, lead safety and these are the things that you do. But sometimes we need a reminder in order to reinforce that. So when I go into their homes and I notice that they have children under six, I say, these are some things to remember. These are some, you know, here's your spray bottle, here's two, here's two buckets. If they don't have them, oftentimes we'll provide them for them. And just a constant reminder of these are the things, these are ways that you can protect yourself and your family. We've heard from uh, two women in this segment, uh, one a mom uh, in Canandaigua, uh, the other in the real estate uh, business, also a, a student a child psychologist. Um, we're going to have a third segment. We'll have a dietitian and a young man who inspects homes and can tell you how to keep your home safe. We'll be right back. And we're back with our third and final segment on childhood lead poisoning. Our two guests are Deanne Woodley. She's a dietitian with WIC. And our other guest is Edwin Agron, and he is with Action for a Better Communities Lead Resource Center. Um, you've heard our guests talk about uh, diet and also about taking care of your home. These are two experts. We're going to start with the lady, uh, Deanne Woodley. What do people, what should people do as far as diet? What should they feed their children to either offset um, the effects of childhood lead poisoning or to try to make sure that they, it's not absorbed in their body if mm -hmm. they don't have it already? They should have a diet that is rich in iron, um, things like dark leafy greens, uh, spinach, collard greens, um, beans, um, whole, whole grains, whole wheat bread, um, dairy products, uh, cheese, yogurt, milk, of course. Um, you know, eat a balanced diet as as you normally would would hope that your children are eating anyway, with three meals a day and snacks, um, and avoid you know sweet and goodies that tend to hang on to the lead. Okay. Really? So you, let's just pick up on it. You said sweets. Uh, a diet full of sweets can actually be worse. It's going to hang on to the lead, and you want something to count, counteract or count, combat the lead in the child's system. So again, you know, healthy diet, um, rich in iron and calcium and uh, fruits and vegetables, and something that we, we all should be eating. Okay. We didn't touch on this in the earlier segments, but uh, women who are pregnant are also susceptible of actually passing, if they are exposed to lead, passing it on to the fetus and actually having uh, a, a baby born who is already lead poisoned. So what should a pregnant woman uh, be eating? Should they be eating things that are high in calcium and iron also? 
Yes, those should be part of her, definitely part of her diet anyway, even if she, you know, wasn't susceptible um, to being exposed to, to lead. And if there's any concerns, then she could be tested as well. Okay. Sounds like good old-fashioned soul food, really, when mm -hmm. you start talking about red bean, or I think of red beans and rice mm -hmm. and things like that and greens. Um, is there any information um, that people can pick up about what they should eat, once again, to combat uh, childhood lead poisoning? Well, there's always a food guide pyramid, um, which we all should be basing our, our diet on. Um, there's my, myfoodpyramid.com um, that they can look on and, and see. Or there should be information available at WIC offices, at your pediatrician's office. Um, mypyramid.com, if I'm not, you know, through the government, um, where you can look on and see, um, you know, what a healthy diet consists of. Okay. And there's one for pregnant women as well and, and young children. Okay, good. Thank you, Dean. Mm -hmm. Well, another thing that, that you've heard about is, is making sure that your house is lead safe, especially an older home. Now, Edwin Agron, um, once again, you're with uh, ABC's Lead Resource Center. You go into homes, you inspect homes. What should people look for? First of all, what homes are susceptible um, to lead poisoning? Well, uh, any home built before 1978, you have to automatically assume that there's uh, lead-based paints in them. Uh, lead-based uh, lead -based paints weren't um, outlawed until 1978. So a lot of homes did use uh, that type of paint to, uh, in their homes. So um, some things you want to look for are uh, bare soil when you're playing outside. Uh, usually bare soil, when there's uh, paint chippings coming off the, f off the house, they fall onto the soil. Kids play there and uh, they're more susceptible to that uh, uh, lead off the soil. Uh, unless it's covered um, with grass or some landscaping, you might want to get the, get the kids off the playing off of there until it's uh, taken care of. Um, walking into the home, you look at the porch, um, you might want to look at uh, some older windows. Um, windows with high uh, levels of dust. Um, dust has a tendency of uh, containing the lead there, especially when you have uh, the two windows rubbing back and forth, creating the friction that the dust falls, the lead dust falls right into that dust. And usually kids uh, go from playing on the dust, hands right into the mouth. Um, and if there's toys there, um, if you uh, uh, know if your kids are playing, they might want to get them away until you take care of that stuff. Um, in order to take care of that, you could uh, use some warm soapy water, spray that area down, and just wipe it down with a cloth. And uh, you can do that about maybe twice a week. That'll take care of that problem right there. Okay. Um, now that the winter season is coming up, you can put a, a plastic uh, covering over your windows. That'll take care of your dust uh, problem and also uh, be energy efficient. You know, So um, that's some things that you can do. Um, when you see uh, some cracking or peeling paint within your home, definitely uh, before you go ahead and scrape it, you don't ever want to dry scrape a, a, a paint off a wall or a windowsill. You want to uh, do what is called wet scraping. And again, another bottle of, uh, of warm soapy water, you wet that area down, keep it moist when you're scraping it. Uh, that'll keep the you know, levels of dust from going into the air down. And then after that, you can wipe it off and paint over whatever you wanted to paint. That reminds me, people should not use, and I'm going to have you explain why, but they shouldn't use any like power sanders, power hoses when they're doing any kind of remodeling if it's an older structure, mm -hmm. and especially if the paint is already deteriorating. Mm -hmm. Why? What happens is with the power sanders and the power washers, um, you're, you're letting the, the uh, you're creating the dust effect that, that, that where lead will be carried and uh, transferred from one place to another place. Um, with a power sander, uh, again, you're not able to wet scrape that area, you're not able to wet sand that area. You always want to keep that area wet. Um, dust goes all over the place when you're sanding. Uh, your kids breathe it in, you breathe it in, you become uh, 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 at risk and so does your kids and anybody around that area also, especially in the outside of the houses. When people uh, try to power wash their outside of the house and it's paint and you see paint chips flying all over the place, you just became, you just uh, exposed and hazard open for your family and other people around you. And what about remodeling, um, especially an older home? I mean, we had Julie Simmons. She and her husband have a, a home that's quite old. 
but an older home, what about remodeling? What sort of steps should you do to make sure that it, it's lead safe? Uh, one, one, one thing you always uh, want to follow are lead safe work practices. And those courses are available, uh, funded through the city at, um, at a bunch of uh, different areas. And um, they, they teach you on how to work lead safe in your home. Uh, it goes everything from how far a plastic needs to be laid down to how, uh, how to paint how to scrape, how to pick up, how to clean up. So it, it shows you how to uh, keep your family uh, safe right. from those hazards. And I just want to add that Monroe County uh, actually offers the courses uh, to any resident within Monroe County. Mm -hmm. uh, they, it's usually twice a month. Uh, the courses are free. Mm -hmm. They're six hours long. Um, you've taken that course yeah. and similar ones, right? Yeah, okay. uh, Cornell Cooperative uh, Extensions. Uh, Extensions uh, they yeah. offer that course on Tuesdays. Okay. So it's a, it's a very um, very educational. I, I encourage people, whoever wants to uh, do some remodeling to their home or even wants to take care of lead problems at their home, to take advantage of that course. And they can get in touch. Uh, they can find out about that by, I know, going to Monroe County um, uh, government yeah. website, mm -hmm. going into uh, environment if they click into there. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Also, um, they can give us a call at ABC. At, um, and um, at the Lead Resource Center, I'm available to do the dust wipes also, and um, give a professional opinion on what you know what you need to do to keep your uh, home lead safe or keep your family from being uh, contaminated with any lead hazards in your home. What's your phone number? How can they get in touch? Um, you can get in contact with us at uh, three two five five one one six extension four 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 four, and uh, that'll be the Lead Resource Center and. We can take. We can set up a time to uh, come out your home and evaluate whatever you need, or answer any questions that you might have. And what's that number again? Three two five five one one six extension four 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 four. Okay, and also uh, the city uh, net, uh, which is now the neighborhood, the neighborhood service centers. Service centers, uh, which used to be net, they also do uh, lead inspections yeah. for uh, rental property and people in a certain income. Yeah. What about income level for the folks that you work with? Um, these, um, well, the, the, for the services that I provide, there's no, I mean, I, I do them, I can service anybody within Monroe County. There's no, I mean, there's no, uh, income level, income guideline for our services. Um, but when it comes down to, uh, servicing for some, uh, certain grants and stuff like that, then that's when I'll, uh, start working with income and verifying certain things. But for, for, for a lead wipe, for a visual, it's open to anybody in Monroe County. Okay. Thank you, everyone no Agron. And thank you, Dion Woodley, uh, for giving us this information. Once again, I'm Joseph Hill. I'm the Communications Director for the Coalition to Prevent Lead Poisoning. And if you uh, stay tuned right after this program, there will be more information available. Thank you for joining us at uh, 292 Baby. If you do want more information, uh, you can call 292 Baby. That's 2229. Thank you again.
Amazing grace. Baby's brains How don't grow by themselves. The sound. But when you sing to your baby, talk to like your baby, me. and play with your baby, I once was his brain cells lost, learn to grow. But now so I'm sing to your baby. Blind, talk to your baby. But now play I see. with your baby. Baby's brains don't grow by themselves. But when you sing to your baby, talk to your baby, and play with your baby, her brain cells learn to grow. So sing to your baby, talk to your baby, play with your baby. Good morning, sunshine. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. Baby's brains don't grow she'll by themselves. Be round the mountain when she but when you sing to your baby, she'll be coming round the mountain. Talk she'll to your baby and play with your baby. His brain cells learn to grow. We will all come out so sing to your baby. Talk to your baby. Play with your baby.